Welcome to my Days of Our Lives official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. EJ stakes his claim on Jude, Johnny, and Chanel awaited for an appointment with a specialist at the sanitarium. Johnny apologized for swimming over Chanel, but she admitted that she had been enjoying the redundant attention. They spotted Holly and compactly gabbled with her before she left. Johnny offered Chanel oyster crackers to settle her stomach. He also streamlined Chanel on his job hunt. He put his resume online and had gotten a many views from original product companies. He'd been allowing about taking the resume down, since utmost film openings were in California. Chanel encouraged him to stay it out. A nanny called them in for the appointment. After the discussion, Chanel and Johnny bandied the croaker. S marks for checking the baby's development 11 weeks and 18 to 20 weeks. They agreed that the 18-week experimental stage would be especially important for learning about any implicit problems. Johnny lamented the waiting and fussing, but snappily apologized to Chanel for making it all about himself. She assured him that she wanted to know how he felt. Chanel marveled at the sonogram, and she said the baby looked like a bean. Johnny reminded her that the bean was an factual person growing inside of her. They talked about what they might want to name the baby. Chanel suggested Noel, since the name could apply to either a girl or a boy. Since the baby would be due around Christmas, Chanel allowed. It particularly fitting. Johnny agreed. Chanel said that while she was still angry with her mama, on some position, she understood what had driven Paulina's conduct. Latterly, Johnny entered a call from an old friend in the product business who had Johnny in mind for an implicit job. Johnny was surprised and thankful, but told the person he'd have to talk the offer over with his woman. When he ended the call, Chanel approached. Johnny didn't tell her who the call had really been from or what it had been about. They decided to get regale. Paulina summoned Melinda to her office to bandy the quarter attorney job. Melinda was pleased to hear fate. J. Had been ousted from the position, but was curious as to why Paulina had wanted to talk with her. Paulina offered Melinda her old job back, and Melinda shocked Paulina by turning down the offer. Melinda was confused, because Paulina had also fired her. Paulina believed the people of Salem demanded a familiar face who was tough on crime. Paulina further felt that the quarter attorney's position could use a strong woman again. Paulina had tired of E.J. Abusing the job to settle particular scores and to get his family off the hook. She reminded Melinda that the quarter attorney served at the mayor's pleasure, and Paulina would surely find working with Melinda more enjoyable than working wife. J. When Paulina mentioned how. J. had been using her conduct at the cabin against her, Melinda sympathized with Paulina. Melinda affirmed that a mama would do anything for her child, as Melinda wished she could still do for Haley. The women commiserated over both having given their children up at birth in order to cover them. Melinda bothered about blowback from. J. Should she accept the A job, but Paulina contended that being the quarter attorney would give Melinda her own power against E.J. Melinda milled it over and agreed that taking the job might come her stylish protection. She accepted Paulina's offer, and the two headed out to celebrate over drinks and regale. At the eatery, Paulina and Melinda were enjoying their mess and raising a toast when Johnny and Chanel entered. Paulina gestured at them and smiled, but Chanel snappily left formerly she saw Paulina, and Johnny followed Chanel. Paulina looked hurt. After Holly left the sanitarium, she met Tate, whom she had texted in the domain. She opened up about the fight with Nicole and the effects Holly had said. Holly berated herself for being so cruel to her mama. Tate advised her that Marlena had formerly told him after he would had a fight with his mama that people frequently lashed out the most at family. Holly verified that Marlena had told her commodity analogous when Holly had gone to see Tate's grandmother. Holly admitted, however, that the visit had made her feel worse. Tate assured her, and Leo caught the close moment. He hid behind the backwoods and tried to take a print with his phone. When Leo fumbled with the phone, Tate and Holly heard the commotion and rushed over to the backcountry. They saw Leo, 
and Tate bemoaned that Holly and he'd been busted by Lady Whistleblower. Both Tate and Holly incontinently contended with Leo to keep quiet. Leo complained that he'd no material for his column and that the scoop had been the stylish one he'd come across in weeks. Leo turned down offers of plutocrat from both the kiddies and pledged that he'd been working on getting a better person. Leo mentioned how he'd lately lost his great love, so he would set up Tate and Holly's innocence and star-crossed suckers act uber-lovable. Holly was quick to correct that Tate and she were not suckers, but Leo cracked that it looked to be heading that way. Leo heaved that he was the nanny to Tate and Holly's Romeo and Juliet. Leo name-dropped all the love-themed reality shows he'd watched and quoted a line from Shakespeare about youthful love bringing feuding families together. He labeled himself a sucker for love, agreed to keep Tate and Holly's interdicted love secret, deleted the prints he would take in, and left. A relieved Tate and Holly participated a kiss. At the D. Maramance, E. J. caught Nicole and Eric kissing in the corridor also faded back into the main room, visibly shaken. Eric pulled down from Nicole, and both agreed it should not have happened. As Eric prepared to take Nicole to her bedroom to sleep it off, E.J. reappeared and acted surprised to see that Nicole was home. Eric explained that Nicole had gotten into a fight with Holly and that Eric had brought Nicole home from the bar. Made an observation about how most men would have taken advantage of Nicole and pointedly thanked Eric for proving chivalry isn't dead. A rattled Eric left. Latterly, E.J. and Nicole had settled on the lounge in the main room as Nicole told E.J. about her argument with Holly. E.J. could slightly contain his wrathfulness after Nicole informed him what Holly had said. Nicole defended her son and claimed that Holly had been through a lot. Nicole admitted that a part of her had also agreed with what Holly had said. E.J. snappily reposted that Nicole was a awful mama. He prompted her not to be hard on herself. Nicole rude not calling E.J. After the fight, but she had been thankful that Eric had helped her before she had done commodity she could not take back. E.J. Asked Nicole what she had done, but she backed off the comment. Wished that Nicole had leaned on him rather of Eric. Nicole reminded E.J. That Eric had sought her out. E.J. Promised to always be there for Nicole and took her upstairs so that she could rest and recover. He noticed a textbook from Eric on Nicole's phone. When Nicole asked D.J. however, he said he'd to step out for a moment, but he assured her he'd return shortly, if he'd be joining her. As Nicole slept, she pictured about kissing Eric. In her dream, still, she ended the kiss by confessing to Eric that she still loved him and that she had wanted the baby to be theirs. Nicole smiled in her sleep. At Sloan and Eric's apartment, Sloan settled Jude down after a bottle and wondered what was keeping his father. Eric arrived and explained that he was late because he'd been picking up two for one chili tykes. Sloan made a comment about Nicole, and Eric again comforted her that Nicole and he were just musketeers. He conceded his history with Nicole, but appertained to Sloan as his now and ever. When Sloan brought up how Eric had been making good plutocrat at the review and that they should be suitable to go better refections, Eric mentioned his expedience of saving for a down payment on a house. Sloan was touched and delighted by the idea of buying a house, as she would no way imagine that kind of future for herself. Eric smiled and said he wanted the whole family experience with Sloan. She suggested that one day, that might include further kitties, and Eric was open to the idea. Latterly, Sloan respected a print of Jude on Eric's camera. She was surprised when Eric reminded her that she had taken the print. Sloan joked that Eric's photography bents were rubbing off on her. Eric called himself, Sloan, and Jude a beautiful family. Eric wanted to make that family by doing well at his job. He told Sloan he demanded to leave and take further photos for his story. Sloan assumed Nicole would be there too, but Eric said he would be alone. The answer sounded to settle Sloan, and Eric left without incident. Following Eric's departure, Sloan answered a knock at the door and was none too pleased wing.j. Invited himself in. Sloan hesitantly asked what he wanted.e.j. Blazon to a distrait Sloan that he was there to take the baby.